Good to have you tuned in. This is a daily report for Wednesday, February 23rd. As predicted, Korea's daily tally has stopped 170,000 today. We'll start with the latest on the COVID-19 situation here. Soa is standing by. Let's begin with the actual numbers for this Wednesday, Soa. Sure, Sunny. As you said, 170,000. That's one of the predictions the government has been making before, although it's no longer forecasted to be the peak of the current Omicron wave. And as infections are still on the rise, we're probably going to see further increases and also that this record is going to be broken in the coming days 171,452 cases were tallied as of 12 a.m. Uh, Wednesday and also more than 171,000 of those were domestic transmissions with 181 cases from abroad and uh, we are roughly seeing a doubling effect again when we compare the figure this Wednesday to last Wednesday uh, as we were in the 90,000s uh, before and uh, we are seeing record high figures across the nation with this increase. Uh, we've got uh, the capitals hold here with more than 41,000 cases. That's roughly 20,000 more from the day before and uh, similar in Gyeonggi-do province with over 53,000. With that, Gyeonggi-do province has surpassed 700,000 in total, so more than 600,000 in total. And for the first time, even Sejong City now over 1,000 cases and uh, Busan as well as Incheon also broke records with over 10,000 cases reported in just a day. And there's also a record high here on Jeju Island as well. And uh, let's take a look at uh, the total number of cases now, which stands at above 2.3 million. And also the number of fatalities is on the rise with 99 people having lost their lives in the past day, raising the death toll to above 7,600. And uh, the number of patients in severe or critical condition has also been rising and for the first time in uh, quite a long time this number has uh, gotten up to above 500. And uh, on to our vaccination figures. So we've got 44.8 million and 44.3 million of the nation's population who received their first and second shot respectively. And uh, on to the booster figures, we've got 30.7 million or close to 60% who got that additional COVID-19 vaccine shot. And let's take a look at the international figures. 1.8 million new cases in the past day. That is a rise from the day before and also an increase in fatality more than 15,700 people have lost their lives in the past day as of noon Korea time. And if we take a look at uh, some countries here that have accumulated the highest number of cases, more than 100,000 new infections in the U.S., Brazil, Russia, as well as Germany. And those are the general updates I have for now, but I'll see you back in a bit. Sonny? All right, so uh, thank you for now. Right, children aged 5 to 11 here in Korea are now eligible for Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine. For more, Choi Min-jong is here in the studio. Min-jong, welcome back. Thank you for having me, Sunny. Right, so let's begin with this latest inoculation approval. Right, the Ministry of Food and Drug Saf Safety on Wednesday gave the green light to administer Pfizer's vaccine to children aged 5 to 11. The ministry approved the use of the Pfizer vaccine in smaller doses with three weeks between first and second shots. And it said the shot has been uh, shown to be 90% effective against COVID-19 and no severe reactions were reported in the clinical trial. The government says that details on when and how the vaccine will be administered will be shared at a future time, but the KDCA is expected to make an announcement on this front sooner rather than later after consulting with experts. Some pundits, Min Jung, are saying that this approval comes amid rising concerns over the recent surge in infections among the young here in the country. Right, Sunny. Currently, one third of our new cases are being reported among those under the age of 20. Authorities are especially concerned over the growing number of infections in very young children. COVID-19 patients aged 9, 9 and below have more than doubled over a one-week span, and they currently account for more than 15 percent of our new cases. And it's particularly particularly concerning because children in this age bracket have yet to be vaccinated. Authorities say parents can call a nearby hospital for remote treatment or visit pediatric outpatient centers if their children show worsening symptoms. And besides taking their temperature, experts say parents should also be on the lookout for loss of appetite and decrease in urine volume. And if this is the case, they advise parents to immediately take the, their children to the doctor. Right, I see. Also, Minjong, authorities have reiterated their words of comfort, so to speak, despite Wednesday's record telly. 
Yes, Sunny, despite the current surge, uh, Korea's Prime Minister said Wednesday that we shouldn't be too worried about the current situation. He said the country already has a system running that has proven to be effective against Omicron. He also hinted at the easing of restrictions once Korea is past the Omicron peak. Let's take a listen. Although we should not be loosening our vigilance and execution of antivirus measures, there's no need to be overly scared about the number of new infections. The Omicron wave is heading towards its peak, but once the number of critically ill patients and deaths remain stable, we will make changes to prevention measures, including social distancing rules. Kim also said that people must have faith that the worst will soon come to an end. Citing the KDCA, he pointed out that Omicron is far less likely to result in severe illness or death compared to the Delta variant and about twice as lethal compared to the seasonal flu. He also stressed that Omicron may even have a better prognosis than the flu for those who got their booster shots. Meanwhile, Min Jung, I understand data shows a stock difference in the pattern of spread amid Omicron as compared to previous variants. Tell us about that. Um, right. Authorities are saying that the current situation is unlike what we experienced in 2020 and 2021, characterized by lower fatality rates and relatively faster spread. They noted that the number of infections jumped almost 15 folds in only a month after Omicron, Omicron became the dominant variant. And over the same time period, however, the number of severely ill patients and deaths rose only 60 percent and 20 percent respective. Right, I see. Now, Min Jung, let's expand our talk to include Soa, who has the latest from this morning's government briefing. Right, Soa? Right, Sunny. Uh, health officials continue to study how fatal or how much less fatal the Omicron variant is. It assessed the death rate uh, uh, recently. It has assessed that the death rate is around one quarter of the Delta variant and twice as high compared to the flu. But this time, the analysis uh, found, focused on the death rate in uh, people that have been fully vaccinated or have gotten their booster shot. The government conducted a study based on some 136,000 COVID-19 patients between April last year and February this year. So what they found is that when completely vaccinated, the Omicron variant may pose a threat level similar to the seasonal flu. In the case of having received a third dose of COVID-19 vaccine, the death rate of Omicron stood at 0.08%. Almost the same when compared to the death rate of the seasonal flu, which stands at between 0.05% and 0.1%. When not protected with vaccines, the Omicron variant's fatality rate comes at 0.5%, which makes it five to seven times more fatal than the seasonal flu. Right, and so I understand officials are stressing the importance of vaccine-induced protection depending on age as well. Right, Sunny, for people aged 60 and uh, below who have received three jabs, the death rate stands at 0%, meaning vaccinations helped enormously in reducing the chances of death uh, when it comes to the Omicron variant. The death rate for those older was 0.5%, but in the unvaccinated, it rose more than tenfold to close to 5.4%. For Delta, the death rate was at around 10.2% for people aged 60 and above, which is why officials say senior citizens who have gotten their booster shot have a much lower chance of passing away than back in December when Delta was the dominant strain. These results seem to be backing hopes for COVID-19 to be treated like an endemic disease once Korea passes its current peak. Let's take a listen to this. Though we have to rely on information from academia regarding the seasonal flu due to the lack of state compiled data, we estimate that annually three to seven million infections occur every flu season, leading to between three and five thousand deaths. Even COVID-19 could become a comparable illness to the flu if more people are vaccinated. Moving forward, so what has been shared about efforts on the home treatment front? Well, Sonny, with a surge in cases and most people being designated for at-home treatment, uh, this number of people who are recovering at home has surpassed 500,000 as of this Wednesday. That's around 40,000 more than the day before. Now, last Thursday, the figure surpassed 300,000 for the first time, and it took just two days to reach. We have hit the 500,000 mark. The government aims to 
to improve the provision of guidelines for patients recovering at home and their families through local health centers and online, including the availability of emergency hotlines. The number of local hospitals and clinics in charge of consulting regular at-home treatment patients has been expanded further to 6,768, and 744 medical facilities are monitoring some 74,000 people that need intensive care. Some 6,500 additional staff will be deployed that will start their duties as early as on February 28th. Which would be a Monday, right? I believe so. Meanwhile, Min Jung, also starting on this Wednesday, small business owners can sign up for additional financial support, I understand. Tell us about that. That's right, Sunny. Um, small business owners who have been affected by COVID-19 restrictions can apply for more financial assistance starting Wednesday. Some 3.3 million business owners will get um, 3 million won each, which is around $2,500. The distribution of this aid will also be processed starting today, which means some business owners will be receiving same-day payments. Applications will be open to businesses with business registration numbers ending with an odd number, and those ending with an even number will be able to apply on Thursday. Those eligible are small businesses who have been subject to new business hour restrictions that were introduced in mid-December last year. And business owners who saw a drop in sales in the fourth quarter of 2021 can apply starting March 3rd. Right, March 3rd. Now, beyond Korea, so I hear global COVID-19 cases have been on the decline, right? Yes, Sunny. The downward trend is continuing now for the third consecutive week, uh, with many countries past their peak of the Omicron wave. And good news is that the number of deaths is also now falling, and that for the first time since early January. Now, according to the World Health Organization's weekly pandemic report on Tuesday, more than 12 million cases were reported in the span of a week last week, which is down by 21% from the previous week. Fatalities declined by 8% on week with some 67,000 deaths. Cases fell almost everywhere except for the Western Pacific region, where cases jumped by 29%. Deaths went up in the Western Pacific and Africa while dropping in the rest of the world. By country, the highest number of caseloads were tallied in Russia, Germany, Brazil, the U.S. and South Korea, which as of this Wednesday ranks 39th in its caseload in the world. And uh, following months of observations, global health officials have noted the Omicron surge in countries with high vaccine vaccination rates has not led to substantial increases in the death rate or hospitalizations. However, they continue to warn of more transmissible variants that can still emerge, and the WHO also updated its study regarding the BA2 sublineage of Omicron. While BA1 remains to be dominant, studies suggest the BA2 has a growth advantage, which is why it should continue to be closely monitored and classified as a variant of concern. Right. Right. And Minjung, despite the highs mentioned by Soa over in the US, I understand the daily tally, however, hovers on pre-Omicron levels. Tell us about that. Yes, Sunny, new cases in the U.S. fell by a whopping 90% from a record set um, around a month ago. According to data from Johns Hopkins University, the country's seven-day moving average has fallen to around 84,000 daily cases. And just five weeks ago, an average of more than 800,000 daily cases were reported as Omicron swept across the country. So it is a dramatic drop. And with cases declining, hospitalizations also dropped significantly. As of Monday, the seven-day average of hospitalizations stood at around 66,000. This is far lower than in mid-January when the country saw around 160,000 patients a day. With the infection curve trending downward, several states in the U.S. have decided to lift mask mandates. Masks are only required indoors in New York and California until the uh, end of this month, with the exception of schools. And New Jersey is set to lift mask mandates at schools beginning March. Right, and in sharp contrast, so here in Asia, countries are still witnessing, like South Korea, record numbers, I hear. Right, for instance, in Singapore, 26,000 infections were tallied on Tuesday, which is a record high. And in Japan, although there's been a slight decline in cases recently, for the first time, more than 300 people have lost their lives, and that according to figures on 6 p.m. Tuesday. And uh, also Hong Kong, meanwhile, due to its surges, is going to 
uh, planning to test every one of its 7.4 to 7.5 million population starting next month, and that's three times in a weekly uh, interval. Right, I see. Right, so as always, thank you very much for the coverage. Min Jung, thank you. See you on Thursday. Thank you. The U.S. has responded to Russia's calls for troop deployment to two territories within Ukraine. Punitive measures targeting major Russian financial entities and Moscow's sovereign debt have been disclosed. Kim Hyo-san has more. Referring to Russia's latest aggression against Ukraine, U.S. President Joe Biden announced Tuesday that the events now underway are, quote, the beginning of a Russian invasion. He then unveiled the fresh sanctions on Moscow. We're implementing full blocking sanctions on two large Russian financial institutions, VEB and their military bank. We're implementing comprehensive sanctions on Russian sovereign debt. In a nationally televised speech, Biden added Washington is moving more troops and equipment to bolster U.S. forces in Europe. But he made clear they would not be there to fight Russia. He also dangled the possibility of de-escalation through diplomacy, stressing Washington remains open to talking with Moscow and its partners to avoid an all-out war. Echoing President Biden, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken explained Russia's placement of troops constitutes the beginning of an invasion. As a result, he told reporters that he has canceled the upcoming meeting with his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov. The two were scheduled to meet in Geneva on Thursday. In Europe, EU leaders unanimously agreed on a sanctions package against Russia over its recognition of Ukrainian separatist regions and its deployment of troops. This package of sanctions that has been approved by unanimity by the member states will hurt Russia and it will hurt a lot. And we are doing that in a strong coordination with our partners, US, UK and Canada with whom I've been in close contact during these hours. The package includes sanctions targeting all of those involved in the, quote, illegal decision in Ukraine. Britain also announced sanctions with five Russian banks having their assets frozen. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson said more actions could follow. Germany has also halted the Nord Stream 2 Baltic Sea gas pipeline project designed to double the flow of Russian gas into the country. The head of NATO also insisted Russia is planning to invade Ukraine. Every indication uh, is that uh, Russia continues to plan for a full-scale attack on uh, Ukraine. Uh, we see the ongoing military build-up. Such international measures were ignited by Russian President Vladimir Putin's recognition of the territorial claims of the self-declared separatist republics in Donbass region of eastern Ukraine. While Putin's move could significantly escalate the risk of war with Ukraine, he says Russia does not plan to send troops into the region immediately. His remarks came after Russia's upper house voted to allow President Putin to deploy, quote, peacekeepers to the breakaway regions. Putin also stated that the Minsk agreement is no longer valid. Kim Hyo-san, Arirang News. Over in Paris, Seoul's top diplomat has shared with UNESCO Korea's concerns over Japan's efforts to add a controversial mine onto the world's heritage list. Yoon Jung-min reports. South Korea's Foreign Minister Chong Eun-yong delivered strong concerns to the UNESCO chief regarding Japan's recent push to get its Sado mines, where Koreans were forced to labor during wartime, listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. He met UNESCO Secretary General Audrey Azoulay on Tuesday in Paris. Chong called for cooperation from UNESCO so that Japan can first fulfill its promise to honor Korean victims at other places that have been designated as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. According to Seoul's foreign ministry, the UNESCO chief said she understands the Korean government's concerns and promised to continue efforts on that issue. 
In 2015, Japan's major era industrial sites, including Hashima Island, where Koreans were forcibly taken to work in coal mines, were designated as World Heritage Sites following Japan's promise to acknowledge its use of forced labor and honor the victims. But these pledges have yet to be carried out. UNESCO and e-commerce expressed strong regret after an on-site investigation in Japan last year that showed that the promise made seven years ago to display the full history of the site remained incomplete. They also discussed balls during cooperation between Korea and UNESCO, including Seoul's pledge to contribute some 5.5 million U.S. dollars to the rebuilding of Muslim monuments in Iraq over the course of three years. The South Korean minister also asked for support to get the DMZ listed as a UNESCO heritage site together with North Korea. The meeting came on the sidelines of the Indo-Pacific Foreign Minister's meeting in Paris, hosted by the EU and France on Tuesday, to discuss security, digital and global issues. Also discussed were North Korea's nuclear issues and efforts to bring them back to talks. There, Chong expressed concerns that historical issues between neighboring countries make regional cooperation difficult, adding that he wished countries would learn from reconciliation in Europe. The comment could be interpreted as referring to thorny Seoul-Tokyo ties stemming from unresolved historical issues, including wartime forced labor and sexual enslavement. Chong separately met his counterparts from several countries, including Sweden and Bulgaria, to enhance cooperation with Seoul. Yoon Jong-min, Arirang News. On the local front, dining out is looking to become a luxury amid the surge in prices of ingredients. And relevant authorities, for their part, are working to better share this trend with local diners. Om Jong explains. Restaurants are feeling pressure to raise their prices as food ingredients are one of the main things getting more expensive amid high inflation. In order to stabilize consumer prices and help customers of restaurants, the government is offering price trends for popular menu items. We will monitor and publish the list of prices for 12 dining out menus to check for price fixing and illegal or excessive price rises. The Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs released a report on Wednesday that shows which of the franchise brands of 12 common restaurant foods have raised their prices. The menu items include tteokbokki or simmered rice cake, hamburgers and grilled pork belly. 22 of the 62 brands that the government has surveyed have increased their prices during the last four months. The government is to release the price trends for those franchises and brands every week on its Food Trade Corporation website. This comes as the cost of dining out in South Korea increased by 5.5 percent last month, with the price index of dining out hitting a 13-year high. The price of ramyeon increased 7 percent on-year last month, grilled pork belly rose nearly 6 percent, and kimbap, or seaweed rice rolls, is up around 8 percent. Big franchise brands have recently raised their prices as well. After Starbucks Korea hiked its drink prices by around 30 U.S. cents last month, other cafes have followed. And fast food franchises, including McDonald's, Loteria and Burger King, have hiked prices as well, citing the higher cost of ingredients and logistics. Om ji Arirang News. And in other news, the province of Gangwon-do here in the country is hosting its annual peace forum this week. Our Shin Yeun was there to bring us this report. In 2018, sports became an olive branch on the Korean peninsula. With the whole world watching, athletes from both Koreas came to the opening ceremony of the Pyeongchang 2018 Winter Olympics under a unified flag. Every year since then, Gangwon-do province has been hosting an annual peace forum, covering agendas like sports, peace and public diplomacy. This year's forum kicked off on Tuesday and is being held both online and offline amid COVID-19. To help online participants immerse themselves in the forum, some events are being held with metaverse technology. And the main theme for the Pyeongchang Peace Forum 2022 is the declaration to end the Korean War and beyond. As one of the main hosts of this forum, the governor of Gangwon-do province explained why this year's theme was selected. 
Not a lot of people know that the two Koreas have been in war for some 70 years. Peace will only be restored in East Asia once the war ends. And this year's topic reflects our request for global experts to help us out. And the keynote speaker, investment mogul Jim Rogers, said that once the 38th parallel is opened, the two Koreas would be the biggest economic beneficiaries. You will have good business in North Korea, plus the transportation, the, the railroads will open again, the tourists will come again. So they're going to be huge, wonderful opportunities once you open up. The head of the South and North Korea Sports Exchange Association said co-hosting the 2024 Winter Youth Olympics with North Korea would be an important step in the right direction. Co-hosting the Winter Youth Olympics will not only develop Gangwon-do province, it will bring peace to Korea, which will then spread to the world. Gangwon-do province has been selected to host the fourth Winter Youth Olympics. And the province is currently trying to co-host the games with Wonsan City in North Korea. In order to host yet another successful Winter Olympics here in Gangwon-do province, experts from around the world will engage in talks until Thursday. Shin Yeun, Arirang News, Pyeongchang. Korea's traditional Thai, the hanbok, is no longer simply being considered an extravagant affair, but also an everyday clothing item with merits, especially given the recent controversy surrounding it. Do take a look. A woman in hanbok, or Korean traditional attire, appeared at the opening ceremony of the 2022 Basin Winter Olympics. She was representing an ethnic minority in China. Korean academics and politicians called it cultural appropriation. Moreover, part of China's so-called Northwest Project, which attempts to claim some of Korea's history and culture as its own. In an apparent response to the latest controversy, K-pop stars such as Suga from BTS and Hyoyeon from Girls' Generation posted pictures of themselves wearing hanbok on their social media. While hanbok is at the center of a cultural appropriation issue to popularize the Korean traditional attire hanbok, the Korean government is promoting various events to show that hanbok can be adapted into everyday wear from school uniforms to work attires. To promote the daily use of hanbok, a modern hanbok exhibition co-hosted by the Ministry of Culture, Tourism and Sports and the Korea Craft and Design Foundation is being held this month. The exhibition showcases some 30 different hanbok work attires and some 15 hanbok school uniforms popular among students, parents and school officials. It aims to share the beauty of Korea at home and abroad. 실제로 이렇게 한복을 보니까 생활에서도 입을 수 있을 것 같고 되게 세련된 옷이라는 생각이 들었거든요. 아 이게 생활 한복이라는 게 제가 생각했던 것보다 좀 되게 모던하게 현대적으로 나와서 좀 깜짝 놀랐고요. 뭐 회사에서 이제 제뭐 저희한테 뭐 제공을 해준다면요 충분히 입을 수 있을 것 같고요. Modern hanbok is created with an emphasis on practical aspects, which is why it's made easy to put on and take off. Furthermore, most of the designs which are difficult to tie are replaced with comfortable decorations. For example, modern hanbok's coat strings are designed with brooches or simple decorations. The fabric is also made from materials used in everyday wear, no typical hanbok fabrics, so that it's easy to wash and manage. Now I'm wearing a work attire. As you can see, its color and patterns and the design, of course, they are really beautiful. And on top of that, it's made in a way that lets you move more comfortably. So I think I can wear this in my daily life as well. Again, daily handbooks focus on practicality while keeping the characteristic patterns, colors, and symbols of traditional handbooks as well. 한복은 어, 아주 화려한 옷은 아니에요. 어, 하지만 굉장히 기품 있고 우아한 옷이라고 생각을 해요. 
그래서 우리 조상들이 추구했던 담담하면서도 소소하면서도 또 기품을 잃지 않는 이런 부분이 있다고 생각해서요. 그런 부분을 중점적으로 살리려고 노력을 합니다. Since last year, the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism has been promoting projects to distribute Hamburg work clothes at cultural and artistic institutions to target the general public and tourists that visit such venues. Moreover, based on a business agreement with the Ministry of Education, authorities are promoting the distribution of Hamburg school uniforms and recruiting schools interested in adopting Hamburg uniforms. So this year, middle and high school students at 34 schools will wear hanbok as their uniforms. 지금 현대 교복보다 더 세련되고 이쁜 것 같고 지금 어 한복 교복 입는다면 더 통풍이 잘될것 같고 시원하고 정말 한복이 편할 수 있을까라는 그런 의문점들을 굉장히 많이 저희한테 제시를 해주셨는데 실질적으로 저희가 이제 그 투어를 다니면서 학부형이나 학생들한테 반응을 보면서 어 생각보다는 굉장히 좋은데 어 이게 정말 한복이라고 이게 교복이라고 이런 의견들을 굉장히 많이 저희가 직접적으로 현장에서 들었습니다. Hwanak High School, located in Yeongdeungpo District, also decided to introduce hanbok uniforms from March this year. 아직 도입은 하지는 않았지만 어, 체험을 했던 친구들은 어, 편안한 것과 또 별개로다가 아, 입, 입, 입었을 때 아, 한복이 이런 매력이 있었구나 그 몰랐던 매력들을 조금씩 이야기를 하더라고요. 입학식이 지나고 더 아이들이 더 입고 활동을 하게 되면 좀더 그런 반응들이 더 나오지 않을까 기대하고 있습니다. Even though we are living in a rapidly changing society, we should protect our traditional culture and heritage. As a part of it, we're looking forward to seeing people wearing modern hanbok as daily wear. This has been Jessica Lee. Is Omicron the end of the pandemic and the start of an endemic stage of COVID-19? Now that is the question in today's panel discussion and to answer it I have Dr. David Kwok at Sun Chenang University Hospital live on the line. Dr. Kwok, welcome back. Good afternoon, Sunny. I also have Dr. Angelique Koetze who is part of the team that first detected Omicron over in South Africa. Dr. Koetze, it's a pleasure to speak with you again. Thank you so much. Good morning. Right. Meanwhile, over in the Netherlands, I have Ingrid Herkama, a freelance journalist, live on the line also. Ingrid, thank you for making the time to join us live. Hi, Sunny. Good morning. Right. Dr. Kwok, we'll start with you then. Let's begin with your thoughts on the traits of Omicron that indicate a possible transition into an endemic state of this pandemic. Right. So uh, uh, to do that, I think we need to clearly define the difference between endemic and the pandemic. Um, endemic still means that we will be having this virus going on locally, but it'll be to the point that with, uh, it is not a global threat. And as opposed to the pandemic, as we experienced in the past couple of years, pandemic is the global threat, which spreads very quickly, but also causing high mortality. Um, so in the sense that endemic is a local um, manageable type of a virus, uh, since we are seeing Omicron to be yielding much lower severity rate as well as the fatality rate, uh, we're um, hopefully uh, foreseeing uh, the phase to go to the, the step of an, it being endemic. Uh, if I may bring up some numbers, uh, the, uh, currently Omicron severe cases rate and fatality rate is marked at around 0.42% and 0.15%, which is much lower than that of the Delta 0.8%. And as we will probably talk about some uh, a few uh, minutes later, uh, it is becoming quite comparable to the numbers that we would have seen from influenza virus. And but not only that, on top of that, uh, the fact that we also have treatment regimen which can block uh, in it in its uh, replication inside uh, inside the human body. On top of also the vaccination, which is clearly shown to 
uh, reduce the rate of mortality as well as the severity. Uh, I, we believe that uh, the, uh, through the Omicron phases, we're, we're uh, going very, becoming very near to the phase of endemic currently. Right. Dr. Koetsi, as I mentioned earlier, you were part of the team, of course, that discovered Omicron in South Africa late last year. Would you say Omicron is paving a path out of the pandemic over there in South Africa as we speak? Uh, that's a, a very interesting question. If we look at our South African data, it is clear from the past two years, uh, we, um, between, we, have four wa we had four waves. In between those waves, we've got a, what I call a three months grace period. Um, so we are now moving into our grace period. And if we, if we would, according to the stats, get us a fifth wave, it would be around May, June. So to answer your question, if we don't see a fifth wave around May, June, as per the past two years pattern or trend, we might be get going into a, an endemic state or phase. However, if we again see either a new variant or a new or the wave with maybe one of the previous variants, it's still going to be difficult to say where we are in the pandemic uh, going forward. So I think th the short answer is within the next six months, um, we would know whether we're really going into the endemic phase or not. And looking at um, the data, especially in South Africa, it's easy because we're not a big country, so and our data is, is, is quite nicely projected. And, and um, we, we look at that and see. We all hope that we're going into an endemic phase, um, but it's still a bit early times. As I said, next six months will tell us. Right, I see. So we'd have to wait until May or June then. Meanwhile, over in the Netherlands, Ingrid, the Netherlands is poised to lift all pandemic-related restrictions come Friday as authorities adopt a new normal amid COVID-19. First then, what can you tell us about the COVID-19 situation there, Ingrid? Yes, yeah, Sunny, it's going really well, actually. Um, the Dutch Institute for Public Health and the Environment reported around 300,000 positive tests uh, last week. That is a 37% uh, fall, which is great. Um, there is only around 1,600 people in hospital with COVID, uh, with 171 currently in intensive care. That's also a, a huge reduction. Um, to give you an idea, uh, current number of people in hospitals about half what it was at the peak in March 2020. And it seems to be mainly young people getting ill and they are experiencing often very mild symptoms. So, yeah, it's going well. Right. And given that scenario, Ingrid, starting from Friday then, are you expecting a complete return to life before COVID-19? I mean, do tell us a bit about the planned exit and the public's response, of course. Yes, uh, that's that's all slightly strange at the moment. Um, it's now two years to the day that the Netherlands confirmed its first case of the coronavirus and almost all restrictions are being lifted in three days time. So currently that means our restaurants, our bars, our saunas, the hairdressers, they're all open again. Um, uh, we even have sport e sports events um, and in two days time actually the coronavirus pass will be lifted uh, and people are uh, allowed to take off their masks. Uh, Dutch citizens are extremely happy with this development. Um, the bars are full. No one is wearing a mask anymore. And um, uh, in two days time, we also can leave the one and a half meter social distancing. So, yeah. Ingrid, what happens to the mask mandate then? Are you required to wear masks or is that being lifted as well? In two days, it's, it's big lifted, yes. And this is causing um, a, a little bit of concern, particularly among the elderly population, where uh, people are, are concerned about how to protect themselves. Now the rest of society kind of has given up and pretends that COVID is no longer amongst us. Right. Dr. Kwak, despite talk about Omicron being milder, recent US findings show its toll, especially in terms of fatality, appears to be higher than those of the Delta. What are your thoughts? Right. I also saw that report that uh, the, very recently the death toll from Omicron and, and its total numbers have surpassed 
uh, what the Delta uh, variant has caused. But uh, we need to really uh, statistically have a look at it in, 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 in regards to the, the fatality rates at which these uh, uh, the, the case numbers cause. So uh, from, uh, from Delta variant, uh, in the time period between August 1st to October 31st, there were about 10 million new cases found, yielding about 132,000 deaths. But if you compare the, uh, that to the number of Omicron has yielded from November 24th um, and on, uh, we have found about 30 million new cases, which yielded about 154,000 deaths. So in comparison, in total number of new cases found, it's about three times as much the Omicron is yielding against Delta, but about roughly about the same to about 20% higher rate of deaths uh, not rate, but higher number of deaths that was yielded from the Omicron. So in comparison, in its uh, proportion, Omicron is clearly um, yielding much less fatality rate at this point. I can say that it, that is about to about a third of the, uh, the amount or quite possibly to about fourth of the amount, uh, which we, if we start calculating our own numbers into this as well. Right. And because precisely of the reality that uh, Dr. Kwok has mentioned, Dr. Kuetze, there are some who claim that they would choose to be infected with Omicron given the mild nature and the lower risk of fatality. How do you respond? Dr. Kuetze. Good question. Um, and they also um, raised that same in South Africa. So um, I will respond with caution. I would say it is difficult, especially if you are older, with comorbidities, overweight, not knowing whether you are healthy or not. And uh, if you then intentionally get infected and not vaccinated, you can get yourself in big trouble. You might become a part of the stats lying in ICU and then part of the death stats. Um, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, I, I also need to agree with Dr. Kwok uh, regarding um, in South Africa, the death rate is, is well one third less with Omicron than with the other uh, diseases. And again, we need to be, we need to start to interrogate these stats very carefully in a way that anyone dying, if you had tested positive at some stage, they would just add it and giving the perception that every, everyone died from Omicron and, it from, and not from the motor car accident and Omicron was um, incidentally picked up. So um, I think we need to look at that. But you're very stupid if you start to get yourself infected, especially certain age groups and comorbidities. You should not do that. Right. Meanwhile, they get themselves vaccinated. Right. So you need to be very cautious, of course. Uh, meanwhile, Ingrid, what preparations perhaps are being made by authorities there to deal with a possible rebound in daily infections in the case of a new variant or any other unfortunate scenario? That's a very good question. Uh, that's very unclear at the moment. Uh, our prime minister has effectively said that the COVID is, is over and, and they're currently looking at a phase out plan. Um, it has not been communicated yet, but I think in um, the future we will we will know that very soon. Um, I think it, it, it will not be uh, including any strict lockdowns anymore. Uh, particularly because the, the population here is, is definitely done uh, with the pandemic. Uh, as you know, there have been very large protests for months um, in, in the Netherlands, but also in other European cities. Uh, and I think, um, yeah, it's, it's very well understood that the citizens are done with the, the restrictions, that they, they, they find it very, very challenging at the moment. So... We will have measures, likely, but uh, not to any degree uh, to the same extent that we, we had before. Right. All right, Ingrid, thank you very much for the latest from the Netherlands. And do enjoy your newfound freedom away from pandemic restrictions. <laughs> thank you so much. Right. Now, back at the local front, Dr. Kwok. Findings show the vaccinated, as my colleagues who are mentioned, are clearly protected from severe COVID-19 and related fatality as compared to their unvaccinated counterparts. Tell us more about these findings. Right. So for those who received their, uh, their booster shot, namely their third shot, uh, the Omicron's fatality marked around 0.08%. 
uh, which is comparable to seasonal influenza's uh, rate of uh, that of uh, in between 0.05 to about 0.1 percent. But it's still in those who did not receive any shots, still marked around above 0.5 percent, which is about five to seven times that of the influenza virus. Um, and also in the uh, elderly group, um, age above 60 years of age, those who received their third shot showed fatality rate around 0.5 percent. But those who weren't vaccinated in that age group still marked that around 5.39 percent. So uh, it clearly shows that uh, vaccination is still the the probably the number one step that we need to take in protection uh, against uh, SARS-CoV-2 in its totalness, uh, whether that be for any variants, whether that be for uh, Omicron or even Delta, or even possibly in the new upcoming variants if it was to happen. So I think once again, we need to iterate ourselves, those especially who are vulnerable, such as those in the elderly age groups. And for those people who have, let's say, uh, underlying diseases such as obesity and diabetes and for those people who are bedridden in a contained hospital, they definitely need to get vaccinated, let alone for those people who are even much younger generation who are worried about the situation. Oh, I strongly suggest that they should also get, they should also choose to get vaccinated as well. Right, and staying with vaccination, Dr. Koetze, do you believe that inoculation needs to remain a priority even as we embrace an endemic state of COVID-19? Yeah, I um, I think so at this stage. Um, I am, however, worried. What we are seeing in the, um, is that um, the breakthrough infections due to the mutations. So, you know, and I know, and I know the, the people are going to, 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 to pick up on this, and that's why I would like to raise it. It is true that you can... Um, uh, uh, get still get Omicron if you're vaccinated. You can get Omicron if you had Delta before. We see that and we see clearly in our daily um, uh, engagements with the patient, if you have been vaccinated or had Delta, um, especially vaccinated uh, your, with your last vaccination in uh, uh, October last year, you, I, you will have to unfortunately test anyone coming in then with an upper respiratory tract infection symptoms because um, it seems that um, the vaccines last against the mild disease around about four, maybe six months, all right? But, and here's the but, what we however see is that vaccinated people, even if it's still, um, you know, uh, uh, they've been vaccinated six months ago for argument's sake. When they get Omicron, for now, because we have stats on Omicron, remember South Africa didn't, only started with our vaccination process in our Delta wave. Their symptoms mild. Look at our hospitalization, 80 plus and vaccinated. So it's clear that your vaccines protect you against severe disease. Um, it escapes mild um, uh, uh, um, detection. But even in your mild detection, if you get it, we have seen the symptoms are less um, uh, intense than unvaccinated people. And so therein lies the thing, yes, we, we need to, to sort of carry on. We don't know what we're going to encounter going forward. We might encounter similar like Omicron, and that's fine, because then we know the vaccine um, or uh, immune escape pattern. But we might encounter something severely worse, and we don't know. So that at for now, your protection will be um, the, uh, your, your vaccines. Um, even if you had, remember, previous uh, Delta in South Africa, that's more than six months ago, you still can get Omicron. So we need to watch the, the T cell responses and your antibody response. Right, because prevention is better than cure, of course. Dr. Kwak, authorities here in the country claim that at the height of our Omicron peak, we may have as many as 1 million COVID-19 patients at home. How prepared is our medical arena for such a scenario, especially in the case of emergencies? Right, so it seems like uh, looking back from uh, the uh, steep jump in, in the home care numbers that jumped more than double the, uh, through the past week or so, uh, it is very likely that we're going to reach a very high of a number in those people who are who will be treated at home, 
And it seems like um, uh, it's being reported that they're becoming more concerned about uh, these cases where people who are at home cannot be transferred to hospitals right in time uh, for their resuscitation in case their um, severity has gotten much worse in a very acute phase. But uh, if we look at closely these cases, it, it are, it, these are matters of minutes rather than hours or even days. So e even if they were to have been monitored or, or, or taken care at a, a, uh, a level up uh, uh, facilities, I think it would not have made that much of a difference in regards to uh, unfortunately them passing away or having still being contained in the ICU units. So for that matter, I think in this case, rather than enhancing the transfer methods as the government is planning on doing, I think there needs to be a step taken where we can closer uh, monitor these patients as in a medical facility instead of their home care system. So that if something was to happen to them, if their condition changed suddenly and drastically, a medical person can directly start treatment on them. So in order to do that, we obviously need to enlarge the numbers of containment facilities, but that is quite limited in our situation where we have limited numbers of ICU beds, even though the government is claiming that we have up to about 2,000 capacity. So I think, so as an alternative, I think we can still utilize the social facilities by uh, deploying more medical personnel to those places so that when they are there, they're not there to just monitor these people, but when in need, they could actually start go ahead with the treatment and even intubate them if it's needed at the care facility. Right. And Dr. Kuetsi, as a medical expert who has observed and studied Omicron's emergence and subsequent exit, if I may say so, what are your thoughts on Korea's efforts to fight it, very briefly speaking? Um, yeah, South Africa got a different healthcare system. We, you can actually easily treat these patients at home. They're not really very sick. Uh, it's about three days um, for most of the symptoms. But the important thing is what we have learned. In Delta, you do not start with cortisone. You wait seven days at least. Omicron, immediately, when you make the diagnosis, start with cortisone, five-day course. And you will um, see a drop in cases regarding um, side effects. You do not need very expensive medication. Um, and like I've said, it's four days or five days. It is, it is so easy to treat, um, but the longer you, you, you stop, you wait to put them on the, on the prednisone or the cortisone, the more symptoms I get and, uh, or complaints. Immediately, it's easy, it's cheap, and you will get your patients out of hospital. Right. Very important. Um, we need to start look at these type of things. Right, so prompt treatment then. Yes. All right, Dr. Koetz, as always, thank you very much for your insight today. And Dr. Kwok, as always, thank you for your thoughts. Thanks for having me. Right, well, that is all the time we have for this edition of The Daily Report. We'll be back same time tomorrow. Join us then. Thank you for now.